So welcome to the stage, our first undergraduate finalist, Miguel. Four months. The time it takes to grow a garden. The time it takes to get used to your new job. The time it takes to graduate your last semester of university. Four months can be all a patient has left to live after a diagnosis of terminal pancreatic cancer four months of chemotherapy. Treatment after treatment, with only a 9% chance of surviving the next five years. One of the most lethal cancers, 52% of cases are diagnosed in the metastatic stage when the cancer has already become fatal. And all over the world, it's a disease that takes the lives of almost half a million people every year. The reality for many pancreatic cancer patients is that there are virtually no treatment options aside from chemotherapy and palliative care. After speaking with clinical experts, we learned that current cancer therapies target cell phenotypes, which kill healthy cells and cause painful side effects. Cancer is a disease caused by mutations in critical genes, which create cells that wage war against the body by becoming resistant to immune destruction and apoptosis. In pancreatic cancer, 95% of cases are driven by a single point mutation, KRAS. We are introducing a new generation of cancer therapies. With Proteus, we cut to the genotypes that drive cancer. So what's fundamental to cancer is the presence of at least one, but usually many, DNA mutations that cause the cell to be oncogenic. Our goal with the Israel's project was simple. What if we could create a therapy that could both recognize and then kill cancerous cells containing those mutations, but spare healthy cells that don't have them? Our therapy harnesses a newly discovered CRISPR system called craspase, and that has multiple components. Cas711 is a nuclease that binds to a 31 base pair RNA sequence using its guide RNA, as well as CSX29, which is a protease that binds to Cas711. The natural target of this CSX29 protease is a protein called CSX30. Upon binding of a target RNA to the CRAS-based system, the CSX29 protease is activated and cleaves CSX30 at a specific residue. This nucleotide level input coupled to a protein level output is exactly what we needed. So shifting gears, the design of Proteus revolves around pyroptosis, an inflammatory type of programmed cell death, which in humans is executed by a family of proteins called gastermins. Gastermins typically consist of a cytotoxic N-terminal domain connected to an auto-inhibitory C-terminal domain by a linker sequence that doesn't have any regular secondary structure. Upon specific cell death triggers, gastermins are cleaved in their linker sequence, separating the two domains and allowing the end terminus to insert, it, insert itself into the cell membrane. In large enough quantities, these end terminal fragments oligomerize into large membrane pores, effectively lysing the cell. And the biggest consequence of these pores is that the cell's contents spill into the extracellular space stimulating an immune response by attracting T cells, macrophages, and neutrophils. Now, this makes pyroptosis of particular interest for the treatment of so-called cold tumors, or tumors that exist in immunosuppressive microenvironments, and which happen to be quite common in pancreatic cancer. Proteus is where RNA, RNA 
detection mediated cleavage of CSX30 meets gas turbine caused cell death. We inserted a portion of CSX30 that's recognized and cleaved by the crash space system into the linker of gas turbines, creating our gas turbine CSX30 fusion proteins. We then customized our guide, in, guide RNA so that it could specifically recognize and target KRAS G12D, which is the oncogenic mutation that occurs in pancreatic cancer cells, but that it can't recognize the KRAS wild type present in healthy cells. Now, when Proteus is delivered to both healthy cells and cancer cells, it'll only be activated in cells with this KRAS G12D mutation, namely in pancreatic cancer cells. Now, once the crash space system is activated, this CSX29 protease will cleave the CSX30 residue that's present in our gas turbine fusion proteins, releasing the end terminus of gas turbines to insert itself in the membrane, form pores, along with a pyroptotic fiery cell death. We designed a couple of these fusion proteins using gas turbine D and gas turbine E with the goal of inducing a inflammatory immune response that could then clean up the tumor upon pyroptosis by recruiting immune cells. So now we have a neat design on paper, but how do we actually go about developing and implementing this in a responsible and responsive way? Human practices have guided the design of our whole project, from the Proteus system to testing in the lab to proposed implementation. A particularly moving conversation that we had was with Kay Kays, one of the longest survivors of pancreatic cancer who now helps to advocate for patients going through the same thing that she went through. A story she told us completely shifted our viewpoint on what uh, human practices is and why it's so important. She told us that a young woman recently diagnosed with stage four pancreatic cancer came into her advocacy group and told her, I'm okay, I know that I'm going to die, but I just want to be around others. Speaking with Kay and other patients made us realize that far too often, the work that we think can change the world is done in isolation. We all work in our own little boxes, forgetting to consider hundreds of factors at play, let alone the person, the actual human life we're affecting at the end of all of this. These conversations redefined what human practices meant for us. It's not just some criteria to check off for the iGEM competition, but rather an opportunity, an opportunity to learn, to redefine how we approach problems, to reflect on how we can best help those we set out to, and to create feedback loops between just another project and the world in which it imagines living. In terms of methodology, our first step was to re-engineer Saccharomyces cerevisiae to serve as our chassis for which we can mimic human cancer development. We then constructed various yeast substrains by introducing our system with and without our different fusion protein designs. We assembled our system into four plasmids using two different inducible promoters. The bidirectional GAL1 and GAL10 promoter allowed us to induce expression of the entire system minus the KRAS oncogenic gene to represent a healthy cell. The very tight DDI2 cyanamide inducible promoter then allowed us to introduce the oncogene, effectively replicating spontaneous development of the KRAS G12D mutation. So once the system was assembled in yeast to test its activity, we performed a series of live death assays by inducing protein expression, then staining the cells and imaging using confocal microscopy. Here's an example of our negative control strain containing the entire system minus any of our gas turbine fusion proteins. Here we see plenty of healthy cells stained in green and a few dead cells stained in red. For comparison, here's an example of our proteus strain containing the entire system plus our best performing fusion protein. It's clear that the proportion of dead cells is much larger and while this is an encouraging result, it's qualitative rather than quantitative. So, confocal microscopy data was processed using fluorescent thresholding to compute the percent survival rates between our various yeast strains. We observed that one fusion protein design in particular caused cell death counts comparable to those in our positive pyroptotic control. Now, to build on this, we're thrilled to announce a new addition to our proof of concept results section. In order to truly visualize pyroptosis in action, we use scanning electron microscopy to take a closer look at the cell surface morphology of our various yeast strains. With it, we were able to see that our best fusion protein could damage the cell membrane in a manner characteristic of pyroptosis. Over the course of the next few slides, pay close attention to the quality of the cell surface. In our negative control, we were able to see a smooth cell surface uninterrupted by pyroptosis or other visible forms of cell death. We're also able to see cells start to die as they starve, 
display a droopy characteristic and starting to shrivel. In our positive control, we can see holes in the cell membrane and the membrane starting to rupture due to the osmotic pressure caused by the pores. What you're looking at right now is our engineered Proteus. Just like the positive control, you can see holes in the membrane and the membrane starting to rupture from the osmotic pressure caused by the pores. Our device works, but we can't stop here. Because although our device works in isolation, we still need more information before we can effectively use it in a clinical setting. This is where the dry lab component of our project comes in. Proteus works by targeting a specific mutation, but cancer is an extremely varied disease, and there's no guarantee that any given mutation present in one patient will also be present in another. Only after sequencing a patient's tumor and identifying what mutations are present in their cancer can we begin to optimize our system to treat them. It's with this motivation in mind that we developed a bioinformatics workflow to identify and analyze a patient's somatic variants and then design guide RNAs to most effectively bind to those. So this process begins with whole exome sequencing of a patient's healthy and tumor cells. We take these DNA fragments and align them to a cancer-free reference genome, which allows us to identify genetic variation within the patient's genome. In this manner, Variants present in tumor cells, but absent in healthy cells, are thus deemed likely candidates for somatic mutations, whose position and mutation type are identified by our pipeline. To test our pipeline, we retrieved sequencing data from the Sequence Read Archive, which consisted of a healthy sample and tumor sample across several sites on a single patient. Our pipeline identified mutations in the KRAS and TP53 genes among all tumors, which both contain clinically established driver mutations for pancreatic cancer. As well, we identified several passenger mutations among the metastatic tumor samples, which may serve as secondary targets for Proteus. Now that we know mu what mutations are present, we can begin to design our guide RNAs. Because our mutation of interest can be complementary to any section of our 31 base pair long guide RNA, we have a few candidates that we can consider. Each of these guides are unique, and they vary in certain characteristics, such as their secondary structure or their binding free energy. Our model will take these and other factors into account and then determine the best guide RNAs with the highest binding efficiency and without off-target effects. These are the guides that we would eventually test in a patient's cells and then use for their treatment. After developing this efficient system to kill cancer, our team needed to figure out how to get Proteus from benchtop to bedside. But for cancer therapies, the approval process is long and arduous. Luckily, our team prioritized discussions with tech transfer offices, firsthand advice from leading startups in the field, such as CRISPR therapeutics and repair therapeutics, as well as safety profile development with lead clinicians and research professionals, all to expedite the approval process. Beyond our proof of concept, we also developed a long-term implementation strategy to take Proteus to the patient. Our idea is to use a gutless adenoviral vector, basically a harmless, dulled-down viral shell, to deliver Proteus into the patient. Afterwards, we'll target cold tumors where pyroptosis can wake up the immune system to clean up striker cancer cells. This is all really exciting stuff, but to have any real impact on the patient, we need to commercialize Proteus. For this reason, our team has developed a robust business plan that outlines our key considerations for commercializing Proteus. Future iGEM teams and aspiring entrepreneurs can go on to use these insights in their own ventures. We're excited to see what you do. The modular expansion of Proteus is far from limited to the gastrum infusion proteins we were able to validate. Using our biobricks, future iGEM teams can pioneer innovative new uses of the cras based system. First, we developed a GFP Degron fusion reporter that allows for quantifiable efficiency screening of a guide RNA library with multiple mismatches in various locations. Next, our focus shifted on a membrane-bound transcription factor that is cleaved by craspase. This allows for controlled protein release based on the transcript level. The parts behind Proteus can be redesigned into various modules and then re-engineered into various new systems from selective cell death to industrial applications controlling membrane rupture for chemical release. With our proof of concept, we show the validity of Proteus, and with our parts collection, we highlight some systems that we've come up with to jumpstart your symbio ideation. We can't wait to see your ideas. Making Symbio accessible starts with education. 
At McGill iGEM, we've had an amazing time over the past year learning as much as we have, and we're strong believers in passing on that knowledge. Through numerous educational initiatives, from workshops to a conference to a podcast series, we've aimed to reach as many groups as possible. We were particularly frustrated with the lack of wet lab experience provided by our school's curriculum, so we created the Synbio Collective, a series of wet lab workshops designed to introduce students to the basic techniques employed in synthetic biology. Over 160 students signed up for these workshops and they were delivered throughout the whole semester. Based on very encouraging feedback that we received, we plan to expand these to even more students this coming year. In terms of collaborations, we try to connect with teams from all over the world. For example, we produce the Biome Book of Proteins. In addition, through collaboration with District 3 Innovation out of Concordia University, we hosted In Vitro 2023, a biotechnology conference looking to connect iGEM teams with the greater Canadian biotech economy through panels, showcases, ideas, and discussions. We further collaborated with around 10 other iGEM teams to provide a guide for future iGEMers through the creation of a bioethics report covering all villages. We hope that this document can inspire student researchers to be adaptable, reflective, and responsible with the technologies they create. These very values were essential to our project, from ideating it to speaking with the people it could one day impact. They were crucial to getting Proteus to where it is today and remain crucial to where we imagine it being. What about beyond cancer, beyond therapeutics, with Proteus, we hope that future teams can take inspiration from our vision and meaningfully approach humanity-wide challenges. There's never been a better time to dream with biology. We started with the dream of expanding treatment options for pancreatic cancer and received overwhelming support. We want to thank the sponsors, the professors, the industry experts, the clinicians, and the patients whose consultations gave meaning to our project. Giving up on life after being diagnosed shouldn't be the status quo. Patients deserve to live their lives and spend time with their loved ones. Though we're still a long ways off from changing what it means to get a stage four diagnosis, we hope that someday patients won't have to count down those last four months. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Miguel. <clears throat>